And welcome to America Decides. Former President Trump and Vice President Harris are campaigning in a combined four battleground states today with just 15 days to go before Election Day. Former President is making several appearances in North Carolina, delivering remarks in Concord, a suburb of Charlotte, tonight. That's after he surveyed damage from Hurricane Helene in Asheville and then held a rally in Greenville. Meanwhile, the vice president is holding her own campaign event in Brookfield, Wisconsin this evening after stops in Pennsylvania and Michigan. And early in-person voting kicks off today in seven states. Voters in some areas of Florida can also begin casting their ballots in person today. As of this afternoon, 15.3 million Americans have voted early so far. Weija Jang and Robert Costa join us now. Weija is at the White House. Robert is in Concord, North Carolina, with former President Trump. Weija, I want to start with you. The vice president is on the road today with former Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Why and what's the import of that? That's right, Major. She is hitting what we call the blue wall state. She began her morning in Pennsylvania. Right now, she is in Michigan, and she will end her day in Wisconsin. Now, why are these three states important? Her campaign says the election will be made or broken, not just in these three states, Major, but in particular in the suburbs, which is why these moderated conversations are happening with the former congresswoman uh, who spoke at length today about the reason why she cannot support Donald Trump, the reason why she is supporting Vice President Harris. And this is an effort, Major, to reach those independent voters or moderate Republicans who might not be ready to vote for Trump for various reasons and who might be persuadable. Now, you know, as well as I do, this is a very small group of people. But the campaign thinks if they can reach these people, that's where they will find a victory, which is why they are having these moderated conversations about everything from uh, maternal health to expanding Medicare to honoring the Constitution, which is what Cheney is really trying to drive home here, Major, reminding conservative Republicans, uh, reminding her party about what happened in the aftermath of the last election and what is at stake. I want to go to Robert Costa in North Carolina. Robert, you know the answer to this trivia question. Which state had a closer raw vote total margin in 2020, Michigan, Pennsylvania, or North Carolina? The answer, North Carolina. Summarize the former President's Day in the Tar Heel State. Major, great to be with you and Ouija. Former President Trump is coming to North Carolina because alongside Georgia, it's part of a changing South on the campaign map. This is not just solid Republican territory anymore. A lot of people moving to North Carolina, South Carolina, other areas of the South in recent years for a better uh, cost of living uh, and a better life uh, in their view. And so this has become more politically competitive. And he's trying to talk about the federal response to the hurricane in, in recent months. And he's casting it as being done in a, in a negative way by the Biden-Harris administration. He has made false claims on that front. At the same time, he's also reaching out to evangelicals. I'm here in Concord, North Carolina, for an event that's very much based on religious liberty, uh, religious issues. They're praying right now behind me and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And so this is about him solidifying that base of conservative Christian voters in the South who are going to make sure his campaign believes will put him over the top. Robert Costa will get back to you. I want to go back to you, Ouija, at the White House. I want to play some sound from you today from the vice president, perhaps looking at the polls, perhaps just encouraging Democrats to keep a very intense focus, calling herself and her campaign the underdog. Let's listen. It's going to be a tight race until the very end. And we are the underdog, and we are running as the underdog. But make no mistake, we will win. So can it be both? <laughs> Ouija? Major, I was just talking to campaign sources today who say, yes, of course, this is part of the messaging, but they really believe it's true also because they have data that we might not be privy to, but they do think this is going to be such a toss up and they don't want to take anything for granted. And this message, this word underdog major really has been at the center 
of her campaign since Harris rose to the top of the ticket because she doesn't want people to get complacent. She wants to make sure uh, that her base of supporters turns out that they vote early if they can and that they show up at the polls on election day. And that's part of the reason why she hammers this home at every rally to say that, you know, we are the ones behind here and we have to make sure that we turn out uh, to change that. And so when you look at the money, it might not say that. I mean, she's brought in a record number of fundraising dollars and continues to do that. But Money is only one aspect, a very important one, uh, but there are other things to consider. And I am told that she really feels like the underdog uh, because, uh, you know, as vice president, perhaps she has not resonated with people as much as the former president has. Of course, the vice president does not always get uh, the center of attention by design. And so that's why, you know, we hear this messaging over and over. I want to go back to Robert Costa in Concord, North Carolina. Robert, as you remember in 2016, one way that the former president, then candidate Trump, described the Access Hollywood tape was locker room talk. Well, this weekend in Pennsylvania, we got some actual locker room talk from the former president in remarks that his campaign said before they were delivered were supposed to be part of the closing argument. I want to play for the audience some portion of that closing argument locker room talk. This is a guy that was all man. His man was strong and tough. And I refuse to say it, but when he took showers with the other pros, they came out of there, they said, oh, my God. That's unbelievable. So you have to tell Kamala Harris that you've had enough, that you just can't take it anymore. We can't stand you. You're a Vice President, the worst. How does the campaign believe that it advances its cause with profanity such as that? I haven't heard one campaign source talk about it advancing the cause in any way. It's Trump being Trump. Over the years, Major, you've interviewed former President Trump quite a bit. I've done the same. I've had actually many interviews over the years that have veered into the topic of golfing great, the late Arnold Palmer who he brought up in a vulgar context on Saturday in Pennsylvania. He also used an expletive to talk about Vice President Harris. Nothing new from 2016 or 2020. What is a view inside the Trump campaign is that Trump's character, conduct, his language is already baked into the electorate's view of the former president. And that the threshold for shocking or alarming voters about something Trump says or does is extremely high after nearly a decade on the presidential stage as a candidate, president, and now candidate again. And Robert, does that play into what is clearly a messaging and mobilization effort of the Trump campaign on the quote-unquote bro side of the demographics in America, meaning macho men getting male voters who are either lightly attached or have never voted before to show up? No, there's no concerted effort to use Arnold Palmer stories or curse words to appeal to younger men who might get their news from podcasts or other non-traditional media sources. It is a, a campaign strategy to have Trump appear on those kind of platforms and programs. But at the end of the, the day, the candidate is not in any way intertwined with this strategy in terms of his rhetoric and his performance. The way it's put to me by so many Trump advisors is they're almost riding the wave of Trump's behavior and trying to use it as a way to maybe appeal to a wider group of younger people who aren't always familiar with his style, but they're in no way directing Trump in any particular direction. Not intertwined rhetorically with the campaign strategy, said beautifully by Robert Costa. Also, our thanks to Weijia Jang at the White House. Thank you very much. Michigan Congresswoman Debbie Dingell was one of the Democrats in 2016 who warned, well, that there just might be cracks in that supposed blue wall for Hillary Clinton. The Congresswoman joins us next to assess the state of the Harris Walls campaign in Michigan. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. I loved Hillary and Bill. You know that. They were friends. Yep. They said they should have listened to me later. You got to go win those unit. We all have to go win those union halls. 
Welcome back to America Decides. That was some of my conversation on the takeout with Michigan Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell way back on September 29th. Feels like a couple of lifetimes ago. Dingell saw trouble earlier than most for Hillary Clinton in Michigan. That was back in 2016. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell joins us now for a take on where things currently stand. She joins us via Zoom from Ann Arbor, which, if you are curious, is in Washtenaw County, Michigan. Debbie, it's great to see you. I know it's close in Michigan. Do you, tech, do you detect momentum in one direction or another presently? Adrian, it's good to be with you. And to be perfectly candid, it's tight. It's just absolutely tight. And who turns out, who votes, is really going to make the difference. And I could not make a prediction right now. Whose ground game looks better to, your, to you? Well, the vice president's ground game is uh, very strong. The, the voter contact is there. Uh, she's been here. You feel the energy in that. But Donald Trump has been here multiple times. J.D. Vance is here. I don't think, quite frankly, they have the ground game that Democrats do. But there's been a little reversal uh, this year in the election in that Democrats have more money than Republicans do. And normally, Republicans have more money than Democrats do. But a Trump voter is a strong, motivated voter, a mega voter is, and the energy is there. And a lot of people, people forget that the vice president's really only been the candidate for two months. They're getting to know her. Everybody's sick of the advertising. They're sick of this campaign. And it's really coming down to who votes. And we've got to turn out our votes. And, Debbie, when you think about this race as compared to the alarm bells you were ringing in 2016, what's different? So, you know, I'm going to, I've been thinking about this a lot because at this point I had said to you, she's going to win and nobody believes me. 2020, I knew that Biden was going to win and I felt comfortable. I think what's different now is that I'm still watching a lot of people try to get to know who she really is. Uh, we've got to get in those union halls. I will tell you, on Saturday, I did a labor rally with six national presidents. In 2016, national presidents knew they had a problem in their union halls, but they didn't want to admit it. Now, the union leaders are in talking to their membership, doing that comparison. They don't, you know, a lot of union members believe everything that Donald Trump tells them and has no idea of what the real record is, how many jobs were lost in just Michigan, 89,000 during the Trump administration, the plants that were closed, uh, the fact that he says he's not going to pay overtime, but the reason he's not going to pay overtime is he doesn't think we should pay overtime. So there's a lot of education that's really being done right down to the last minute. Debbie, you mentioned that there's still some gap between knowing who the vice president is. Is there time to close that gap of understanding or appreciating or getting a sense of who the vice president is? Yes, I think you're seeing her do it. You've seen her. Uh, she's been in Michigan a lot, and she's back. She's in Michigan right now. She's coming back later in the week with Michelle Obama. President Obama is here tomorrow. I think you're seeing a lot of what needs to be done, done. I think, you know, quite frankly, I think people maybe took the eye off of Michigan and Wisconsin and just thought it was about Pennsylvania, and we got to do all three. But you know what? People know they've got to do all three. We're rolling up our sleeves. People are out there doing the work. There is an issue that you know well, Congresswoman, uh, in the area near Detroit, Dearborn. There was an uncommitted effort during the primaries. There is still concern about Gaza. What is your level of concern about Democrats who otherwise would participate sitting this election out as a protest to Biden-Harris policies in the Middle East? I, look, I'm going to be blunt. That's just a real issue. You cannot escape it. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, there are so many raw, passionate feelings right now on all sides of this issue, which is one of the reasons that I say the work has got to be done, because quite you just need to accept the fact that some of the votes that might have been there are not going to be there. I, you keep trying to talk to people, have them understand that this is that Donald Trump, one of the first things he did is to try to do a Muslim ban. He talks about incarceration camps. He talks about all of that. But we've got to make up those votes in other places, which is why it is so important that we turn out the votes. And we, we just have to do it. Is Jill Stein a factor in Michigan? Yes. Uh, I... Uh, 
she was, you know, she did a rally in Dearborn last week. She was on the University of Michigan's campus. Uh, it's she a vote for Jill Stein in my mind is going to be a vote to help Donald Trump, but third party candidates have notoriously caused problems in Michigan. So we've got to. Um, it, it's not. I understand why people are voting for Jill Stein, but she's not going to. The reality is, and I say this with all due respect, she's not going to win the presidential election, and people really need to think about what the next four years will be about and what the contrast in is in these two candidates. Always a candid, candid conversation. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, thanks so very much. Thank you. Overnight, Israel carried out airstrikes across Lebanon. The new attacks come just a day after a Hezbollah drone targeted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's home. CBS News foreign correspondent Rami Innocencio is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Major, good evening. Tension across Tel Aviv today. Israel's military downed five Hezbollah drones over the Mediterranean Sea, and flights were halted at Ben Gurion Airport for a short time. And separately, just after sunset, we heard a boom rumble across the city. Moments later, the IDF sent out a notification that it was a projectile crossing from Lebanon, but that it then fell in an open area someplace in central Israel. Now, all this happening as Secretary of State Antony Blinken is expected to land here in Tel Aviv imminently for his 11th time since Hamas attacked last year in order to try to resurrect a ceasefire deal. Meanwhile, President Biden's special envoy, Amos Hochstein, is back in Lebanon for what he said was the sixth or seventh time there. He landed just after Israel's military launched airstrikes on dozens of facilities used to finance Hezbollah. A U.S. official told CBS News that he is there to try to find an end to the conflict, and today he did meet with the Lebanese speaker, Nabil Berry, and that is notable because he is aligned with Hezbollah. Blinken, meanwhile, is expected to shuttle around the Mideast, perhaps to Qatar and Egypt, too, since they have been mediating countries through the end of this week. Major. Remy Innocencio, thank you. Non-citizens are not voting in this election. Let me say that again. There is no evidence non-citizens are voting in this or previous elections. Next, what officials are doing to try to combat widespread falsehoods on this topic. That's next, Streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Non-citizens voting in our elections is extremely rare. Nevertheless, some Republicans suggest this is some sort of widespread problem. CBS News chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford went to North Carolina to investigate. Last month, the Republican National Committee's Protect the Vote Tour rolled into Raleigh, North Carolina with a message. Only American citizens can vote. To find or stop potential illegal voters, Republicans have filed lawsuits across multiple states, including this one in North Carolina, arguing improperly managed voting lists could open the door for significant numbers of non-citizens to vote. The North Carolina Board of Elections is refusing to take the steps to take illegal immigrants off the voter rolls. Echoing political message of the Republican nominee. And a lot of these illegal immigrants coming in, they're trying to get them to vote. It is a lie. It is a myth. But Democrats like Juan Perano, head of the Latino advocacy group LULAC, don't see it that way. Why would a non-citizen vote. Latinos are not going to make the trip to the United States and literally put themselves in legal jeopardy by registering to vote and actually voting in an election. Non-citizens have registered to vote in the past. Since the last election, several states have taken steps to remove thousands of potential illegal voters from their rolls. But officials say the number of non-citizens who've actually cast votes in federal elections is minuscule. North Carolina identified less than 50 in its most recent audit, although that was in 2016. So usually this is a total non-issue. We don't believe that there's any proof at all whatsoever that this is a widespread issue. It is illegal to vote if you are a non-citizen. Don't risk your American dream. The fight to clean up voter rolls and prevent non-citizens from voting is a focus of conservative election integrity groups who are distributing mailers and hosting in-person events. They are voters that are, that are most likely to be ineligible or illegal. 
Jim Womack is leading a team of more than 1,800 volunteers in North Carolina who are combing through voter rolls to identify what they consider suspicious voters. And you're trying to come up with county by county lists. Suspe it's a list of suspicious voters. Again, not necessarily illegal or ineligible voters, but people that, that hit our suspicious list. CBS News obtained a video of Womack discussing how to identify those suspicious voters. We showed it to him to get his explanation. If you've got folks that you uh, that were registered uh, and they're, they're missing information and they were registered in the last 90 days before the election and they've got Hispanic sounding last names, that probably is a is a suspicious voter. But why would you single out Hispanic well, sounding I, last names? Well, in name? that case, I would have to listen to the full context. The Hispanic sounding last names certainly is not exclusive. Anyone who is lacking the required information, we certainly would, would consider them as a suspicious voter. We are trying to find every illegitimate voter and, and to challenge the ones that shouldn't be voting. Womack says he expects his group to challenge at most a few hundred voters. Still, activists like Proano question their motives. If they have to contest these elections, what they're going to go back to is non-citizen voting. They're laying the groundwork now to contest the election in November. Delighted to have Jan Crawford here at the table for more on her reporting. Walk us through what you have learned and the actual statistical incidents of non-citizens participating in U.S. elections. Well, I mean, I think the one thing people agree on, if you can agree on anything, is that it's illegal to vote if you're a non-citizen. It's against the law, federal law, and it hardly ever happens, right? right? So that's and the issue. And just because you show up on a registration list does not mean you're a voter, because in many states that allow undocumented persons to obtain a driver's license, you can automatically become registered. You may not even be aware of that. That doesn't mean you intend to vote or ever have voted. And I think, Major, you've just hit exactly the point. And that's where a lot of the confusion has come in, because people see, like, well, what about 6,000 in Texas? And what about, you know, in Alabama and in Virginia? Those are... Uh, non-citizens who ended up being registered to vote, perhaps unintentionally, because as you said, you can get a driver's license, and you know if you don't check that box that you're a citizen, then you can end up on a voter roll. And that's why we've seen different states uh, flag those voters and try to take them off the rolls. But we've also seen um, some Republicans, including the former president, try to make this a big political issue to suggest that non-citizens are voting in numbers that would, you know, be so extreme that it could potentially affect the outcome of the election. And obviously, you've seen Democrats push back strongly on that. And I mean, we got some resistance even among Republicans in North Carolina, including uh, the man that we spoke to. He's got about 1,800 people. I think they're mostly senior citizens sitting at home on their laptops, mm -hmm. uh, going through uh, some of these voter rolls, uh, voters that maybe didn't provide the required information. Uh, and they're looking to try to see if there's any non-citizens on the rolls. And if they think they found one, then they're going to throw a red card, you know, to use some right. sports analogy, and try to challenge it after the election as a potential non-citizen voter or an illegal voter. They're not just looking at, at non-citizens. They don't think they're going to find that many. I mean, even they concede maybe 200 at most. And, I mean, do we think North Carolina? I think right. probably if, if it's going to be that close, we're, we're going to be talking about a lot of other things there. But it has led to confusion. And uh, Democrats believe that that's part of the plan, right, to, to create confusion so doubts, and potentially so doubt. Right. Jan Crawford. And she mentioned possibly 200. North Carolina was decided by more than 74,000 votes for former President Trump in 2020. Just keep that in mind. It's close to Election Day. Where candidates go? Well, it says a lot about their intentions and whether they believe the map needs to be exploited. Next, CBS News Executive Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto, joins us to break down why the candidates are going to certain cities in those closely contested states. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. It's not a surprise Vice President Harris is in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. What's interesting is where she's going and why. And for answers as to what that's about, I want to bring in CBS News Executive Director of Elections and Surveys, your friend and mine, Anthony Salvanto, to find out. Anthony, break it down. Sure. Oh, I'm here at the map where you and I are going to spend quite a bit of time <laughs> on election nights. I figured. Hours upon hours. Hours upon hours. All entertaining. All yes, entertaining. Yes, all in, uh, riveting. Though, you know, that goes without saying. 
So look, let's break out the map. The short answer to your question, Major, is that's where the votes are. In Hello. Partic in particular, for a Democrat, right? So if I pull up, let's say, the 2020 presidential race, where Biden won Wisconsin, and you see the red and you see the blue, but what I like to do and we will do is say, okay, let's make this map in 3D and that the higher bars are going to represent more votes. And what you're going to see here when I do that is that in places like Milwaukee, in places like Madison, that's where you get large Democratic margins, right? So it's about turnout. In this case, you got 180,000 more votes for Joe Biden out of Milwaukee. Kamala Harris is going to need to replicate that in many ways, right, to offset how well Republicans do throughout so many other counties in the state. But there's another part of this, too, that I wonder about, and that is a lot of these areas around Milwaukee are Republican areas, as you can see in the map here. She's going to try maybe to pull off some of those Republican votes, maybe get some ticket splitters. We'll see how well she does. But what I want to do is show you guys then the way in which that might break down and the way in which she might be able to find ticket splitters. Let me pull this up here, okay? This is the 2022 races in Wisconsin. And what you see doesn't look like big numbers, but you see that the Republican Senate candidate at the time ran ahead of the Republican gubernatorial candidate at the time. Does that tell you that there may be some Republicans willing to cross over and vote for a Democrat? Maybe the campaign thinks so, but that's what the numbers say, and that may be one reason why they go to a particular place, Major. Anthony Salvanto, thank you. And a quick reminder, if you enjoy the takeout, as I know you do, Anthony Salvanto is our special guest this week. Check that out on all podcast platforms. I want to bring in our political panel, Shelby Talcott and Hugo Lowell. Shelby is a political reporter for Semaphore. Hugo is a senior political correspondent for The Guardian. Hugo, I want to start with you. Great to have you here. You had a piece over the weekend about issues potentially for the Trump campaign in its canvassing, its get-out-the-vote efforts in Arizona and Nevada. Summarize those for the audience. Yeah, so America PAC, which is Elon Musk's PAC, is effectively doing the brunt of the Trump campaign's ground game. They have by far the largest presence in each of the battleground states. And so, you know, we decided to have a look at how effective that get out the vote operation is going. And we effectively gained access to all of America PAC's back end data through a bit of a leak in Arizona and Nevada. And what we found is roughly 20 to 25 percent of the doors numbers that they're supposedly hitting are being flagged internally as fake. That's basically where a canvasser goes up to a door and basically doesn't survey or reports it from miles away. And we found these instances of canvassers who effectively sitting half a mile down the road at a restaurant. Uh, one particular guy was uh, at a Guayos on the Trail restaurant in Globe, Arizona, who was marking doors. And when you're having that rate of fake doors or frauding doors, that becomes a big problem. Just to put that number into context, America PAC is hitting about 35,000 doors a day in Arizona right now. About 8,500 of them are being flagged as fake. That's a lot of doors. I mean, if you think about the winning margins in some of these states, it's mm -hmm. going to come down to 10,000 or so votes. And Hugo, it's been my experience that this flag rate, even in well-organized and well-developed get-out-the-vote, door-knocking, canvassing campaigns, can be about 5%. 5% is what you sort of tolerate within a campaign. 20 to 25% would be borderline intolerable. You just don't know what's, what's happening out there. You're I blind a little bit. I think that's fair. And, and you know, like... It is very possible that the number is even higher and may get higher going into the election. You know, America PAC is trying to ramp up its operations really quickly. They're trying to staff up. And they're turning a bit of a blind eye, as far as we can see, to some of the fraud that's going on because they're trying to hit these numbers. And if you're hitting more numbers, the rate also increases. Was that leaked to you, do you believe, to surface this issue? I think in part, look, part of this is definitely there are a number of canvassing sub-vendors that America PAC has outsourced this to, and there is definitely competition among the vendors because they all want the big contracts, and there is, there is that possibility. But it is abundantly clear across the board that there are doors being faked and that this is now a problem that the Trump campaign is going to have to deal with. Shelby, I want to talk to you about a fascinating piece you had in Semaphore about the media strategy for the former president. Let's be honest about this. It disdains mainstream media. It considers us a borderline irrelevancy and embraces the bro podcast universe. 
Yeah, Explain that's, more. That's exactly right. So the Trump campaign, this entire cycle, has taken a really unique approach when it comes to media. And they've been focusing far less on broadcasters and cable news and far more on these podcasts like Theo Vaughn and Sean Ryan, these really big podcasts that are largely watched and listened to by males, which, of course, makes up a big chunk of Donald Trump's base. And the argument I heard from the Trump campaign was they believe that a lot of viewers who traditionally would go to cable news now no longer trust cable news. And so they are leaving cable news and going to these independent podcasters and listening more to them. So they feel that it's it's more effective for them to sort of bypass the so-called mainstream media and just go right to these YouTubers. Not to bore you with the history of broadcast television, but cable started as an alternative to the supposedly slow-witted, slow-footed mainstream media, mm -hmm. but I digress. Uh, Shelby... What I found fascinating about your story, among other things, was the obsession, maybe that's too strong a word, that the Trump campaign has with the comment sections of these podcasts. Why do they care about that? And why are they confident that that's an indicator they ought to pay attention to? Yeah, this was really interesting to me, too, because they kept essentially uh, pointing back to the comments. They would say, well, if you look at Kamala Harris's Call Her Daddy uh, comment section, 80% of them are negative. And if you look at our podcast with Theo Vaughn, almost 100% of them are positive. And so they argued to me that this essentially shows what real Americans are thinking when it comes to these podcasts. Now, I'm, of course, skeptical. They also talked a lot about the difference between YouTube views and broadcast views. Those are not necessarily comparable because you could watch a YouTube video for three or four seconds and it could count as a view, whereas those Nielsen numbers are, are done much more, much more strictly. Um, so it, it is an interesting comparison. I'm not sure that it is all, all accurate, but they are certainly making this a really big focus and they really like it. Hugo, this seems to be combining two things, inferential data versus hard data. And that's also about what your story is a little bit about. Do you have hard data or do you have inferential data? And campaigns often dis are decided on the difference between the two. Look, the data in terms of the number of potential doors is concrete, right? They are the numbers being flagged in what, what, what is internally called the unusual activity logs. Whether or not you can gauge based on that is... But it's sort of a meta adequate. thing for the Trump campaign. A lot of inferential data versus what the Harris would, campaign would tell you and tells anyone who talks to them for five seconds, our data is hard. We know our GOTV is real, our canvassers are real, our literature is real, our back-end information about the response that our canvassers get is real. We're constantly collecting it and updating it. They would argue that's an inherent strength of theirs. But it's a, but it's a sliding scale, right? Mm -hmm. In the previous iterations of Republican presidential campaigns, when you had the RNC victory, that was the RNC's program right. where you have ardent Republicans who were volunteers and going out of, you know, out of their way to try and do these get out of the vote efforts, these guys are hitting the doors. When you go to paid canvases, it's subcontracted and subcontracted and subcontracted out. The, you know, we've heard stories about people who are doing the get out the vote operation as part of America PAC's field operation. You know, some of these guys are magazine delivery guys or like paper delivery guys. They frankly don't care or are as invested as the volunteers who are knocking on doors. And so you look at the totality of this and you say, okay, you might have hit 35,000 doors 8,000 of which are probably suspect. If it was the RNC program, you might be like, well, actually, the fraud might be lower. But with paid canvases, you can probably expect that to be a but lot I, higher. And I think that's also why, in a lot of ways, this campaign that the Trump campaign is running is really unique, and it's sort of an experiment, right? The Trump campaign is outsourcing a lot of mm -hmm. its ground game in a way that we really haven't seen before, and it's concerning some Republicans. We've both spoken to Republicans who are concerned about it, and in the same way, they're taking a unique approach to the media. And we don't know how those two things are going to end up, if it's going to work for them or if it's going to not until after Election Day. A word applied more than once to former President Trump. Unique. Shelby Talcott, <laughs> Hugo Lowell, thanks very much for your time. Elon Musk is pledging many money rather to swing state voters who sign up for his pro-Trump political action committee's petition. Ahead, whether this promise from the world's richest man is even legal. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro is calling for an investigation of billionaire Elon Musk for potential election law violations. This weekend, Musk announced that he is giving away, randomly, 
$1 million every day through November 5th to a swing state voter who signs a petition for his pro-Trump political action committee. Misk Musk has already committed more than $75 million to a super PAC supporting the re-election of Trump. Theodore Schleifer joins us now. He's a campaign finance reporter for The New York Times. Theodore, great to have you with us. Thanks for your time. Is this thing that Musk is doing legal? We do not know because, obviously, Major, this has never been done before. Um, we have seen plenty of sweepstakes in kind of uh, modern political campaigning, you know, donate a dollar and you'll be entered to win, you know, uh, a boat tour with, with the candidate. Um, so that happens all the time. I mean, the, the payout here is, is way bigger than we've seen before. And the key thing legally is um, what voters in Pennsylvania now are being asked to do um, really depends who you ask. Are these people being asked to register to vote in exchange for the chance to win a billion dollars? Because that seems to be illegal. Or are they just being asked to sign a petition? Who doesn't like to sign a petition? Maybe you win a million dollars. But it just so happens the petition is only open to registered voters. So, you know, critics would say that this million dollars is being is an inducement to register to vote. And that, in their view, would be illegal. Because the inducement to register to vote carries with it the promise of financial gain, which is, in a sense, trying to at least suggest recompense for doing something overtly political. That would be where this would possibly violate the law, correct? Right. It, it, it is without a doubt illegal to pay someone to register to vote. Um, so the question is, is this benefit um, a payment to register. I mean, there are things that are payments um, for for voting that um, are, are pretty common in American society. Like, you know, in, in the Justice Department manual, things like paid leave for voting is, is a benefit that's very common in workplaces. Um, or it is not illegal to offer free rides to the polls. We see plenty of uh, voter turnout organizations do things like that. And, you know, those are benefits that you could argue have some uh, value. But it is explicitly also stated in the Justice Department manual that you cannot offer um, uh, a bribe such as a lottery. Uh, that, that is explicitly referenced as something that is disallowed. So, look, this is a legal question. Also, the election is, of course, in two weeks. Also, you know, uh, prosecuting these crimes is pretty difficult. So it's a gray area. And, you know, Elon's probably going to have no issue uh, getting away with it. And there's a sense, Theodore, at least from me, that Musk would like nothing more than to someone to come after him on this. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's not a... Uh, uh, see, see what they're doing? See what they're doing? I can't even get people to register to vote without them coming at me or some sort of thing. We're trying to help people pay for their, pay for their dinner with a million dollars. What a, what, a, what a mensch. So one thing I'd like to ask you about, Theodore, as you do this work, because people get involved in politics for all sorts of different reasons. Elon Musk has many companies. Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, Twitter X. And yeah. according to a graphic that appeared in the New York Times, and perhaps you had a hand in this, five cabinet departments and six independent agencies are either investigating or involved in regulatory oversight of all these Musk-led companies. Seems like he has a lot at stake if Trump wins. Sure. I mean, Elon has joked that he'll be in prison uh, if, uh, if Harris wins. Um, I don't know about that. But, like, clearly, look, I mean— um, not the first time that a, a mega donor has had business interests before the government. Um, you know, I think what is notable is just how involved Elon himself has gotten in this campaign. Um, you know, I've covered donors for for a decade now, like not uncommon for a rich person to want to approve an ad or at least see an ad beforehand or, you know, want to sign off on big strategic decisions. But like right now you're showing on the screen, you know, here's Elon speaking at a rally, right? Um, I attended a Elon town hall, one of those town halls the other day in Pennsylvania. Um, he's clearly involved himself in this campaign in a way that suggests that he feels the stakes. Does he feel the stakes personally in terms of kind of all those federal investigations? Probably. You know, he also says the stakes for democracy, in his view, are, are profound as well. So, um, yes, Elon Musk cares who wins <laughs> in two weeks. And just based on what you just said, Theodore, as I think one of the things that's distinct about this is the obviousness of Elon as compared to other big donors. Yeah, look, I mean, um, in a lot of ways, it reminds me of covering Trump, right, where um, reporters or, or, or critics are sort of looking for the goldmine uh, nugget that shows kind of what 
he's really saying behind the scenes. And with Musk, um, you know, he kind of tweets what he thinks, right? And right. you have sort of a time diary of what he's thinking. You know, like for instance, there's been a lot of questions about what's going on in a super PAC and early, earlier this summer, earlier yep. this fall, Elon Musk tweeted like, I'm looking into the problem, something like that. Like you don't need to no. find what he's saying privately, he says it publicly. No, unfiltered as always. Theodore Schleifer, not unfiltered, on point. Thank you very much. We've heard a lot about the border this election cycle, but what do Americans who actually live near there have to say? One of our reporters is spending this week touring towns located near there to find out. That's next, you're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Immigration, as you well know, has become one of the most heavily discussed topics of this election cycle. That discussion has not always had a lot of accuracy. But here's a larger question. How does this issue impact Americans who actually live along the border? And how does that compare to how this issue is discussed in Washington? CBS News is touring several towns located along the border over the course of this week. Our own Omar Villafranca began this trip yesterday in McAllen, Texas. He will conclude it Friday in San Diego. He joins us now. We are here in Presidio, Texas in the Big Bend region. This is a very remote community, but right behind me is the U.S.'s border with Mexico. This is Presidio. On the other side is Ojinaga, a town of about 30,000. Presidio has about five. Now, we talked to the mayor, and he told me that they don't have immigration surges that you see on TV here. There's not a big rush of migrants that have ever come in here because it is so remote. But what he does want to tell the next president, whether that be Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, is that there has to be a new set of rules by Congress for immigration reform. But also, he wants to beef up CBP, but not in the way you would regularly think. He says that that port right there doesn't have enough workers, and that means he cannot get enough business coming in from Mexico over this border. Why is that important? He wants more cattle coming over, more produce, more goods. That would bring revenue into this area. That's what he wants from whatever happens in the future with the next president, more business for this area. Interesting note too, he says this is one of the few bridges where drivers will pay a toll in Mexico to cross it, but they don't pay a toll here to come into the US and into Presidio. He also wants that change. He says that little bit of money could mean big changes here in Presidio, updating the sewer systems, fixing some of the roads. So this is not a big headline grabbing, look at all these migrant surges. He says that's not a problem here. Whatever happens in the next administration, whoever that may be, he actually wants the gridlock to stop and progress to happen on immigration reform for the betterment of his city. Major. Omar Villafranca, thank you. First Lady Jill Biden has unveiled a brand new public White House tour. It's the first facelift this tour has received in decades among the changes. Visitors can now enter the diplomatic reception room, which, as the name suggests, is used to welcome foreign leaders and diplomats. Plus, digital photo displays and interactive videos from the president and the first lady are now incorporated along the tour route. Now, this is important. The process to take this tour is still the same. You've got to request a visit months in advance through your representative in Congress. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report starts right now.